Hey everyone, this is Ma Nithya Anamaya and this is the interview series called Lessons Learned in Life where I bring on lots of different people from all walks of life, from different cultural backgrounds, experiences and really just coming on and sharing their story to then provide anyone that's watching this um, now or in the replay um, some value and some lessons they've learned along the way to hopefully help you with wherever you are or just want to hear um, you know people's background and people's stories so today's guest is going to be a phenomenal man he's a beautiful man and I can't wait to have him on his name is Nathan Miola he is just here awesome bring him on Hi, from wherever you are and wherever you're tuning in from, let us know where you are. And Nathan's just about to come on. Where is he? Hey, hey. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Welcome. I'm great. How I'm are doing you? really well. Yeah. How are you? Oh, so nice to hear. Very good, very well. It's been a little while since we got up, but yeah, very well. So great to see you. No, there's no delay, it's just me. Delay, I think. <laughs> you too. You... <laughs> oh, no, no, that's okay. <laughs> All good. <laughs> I wasn't sure. That's okay. So welcome to the interview series Lessons Learned in Life, where I bring on lots of different people from all sorts of backgrounds gone through all sorts of journeys. We've certainly had lots of different experiences shared so far um, and we can't wait to hear your story and people already tuning in, which is awesome. So how about we kick it off and get you to really start where it all began and tell us about maybe what life was like oh, wow. as a child okay. for Nathan. Um, I was always told to be wary of a story that starts, well, it, start, it, happened, it started when I was three. <laughs> But hey, everyone, I see some beautiful people in here, Carrie, yeah. Connor, Adrian, good to see you guys. And thank you so much for having me. Oh, um, when you sent the request, I was I was totally honored and, and absolutely jumped at the chance because I love what you're doing. Uh, and I love you and I love everything that you do. So so thank you. Um, uh, wow. Okay, you want me to start at the beginning? What was life like for me? Uh, my childhood was was pretty average it was pretty average um in a very very uh in a very very positive way uh i i i grew up kind of never really uh needing or wanting anything that uh, that i didn't have uh, obviously born in sydney yeah, in a beautiful family with um mom and dad who were who met when they were very young and um, uh, grew up with with uh, a lot of love in the house and a lot of a lot of good times, um, and uh, that was basically you know, what it was like for me. Um, uh, but as always, <laughs> um, no matter how much we can reflect back on uh, and and express gratitude for how good things were. Um, as uh, as a child, I was uh, I was a, a very deep, very deep child, um, and felt very deeply, and uh, was scared of, of of how deeply I felt and the things that I felt. So uh, really, uh, in not feeling safe uh, to express any of those things that I felt, I found other ways to uh, deal with with those emotions. Um, and, and, and took the relatively minor. Have we cut out? Is that just me? Can you guys, have you guys paused? It's kind of frozen. I don't know what's happening. Hold on. If anyone's watching, there are a few of you watching. Can you just tell me? I don't know which way. Or oh, Nathan's cut off. He'll be back in a sec. That's all right. <laughs> all good. It happens. That's just the way it goes. He will be straight back. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Let us know where you're coming in from. We were just in the middle of getting Nathan to start 
telling us really what childhood was like for him because he's got a big story to tell and it's sometimes nice to hear, you know, like what was the basis for some of those things, you know, it doesn't really start from nowhere when you go through an epic journey. So, you know, it has to have started somewhere. So here he is, awesome. Hi, hi for everyone tuning in. Nice to have you all coming on and hearing all about Nathan and his story. He's just getting at it on now. So, hey, just some technical issues, all good. Back? Oh, yes, we're back. We're back off. We're getting lots of love. So, we, we've got you. So, everyone, please uh, stop calling me uh, because what happened there was someone called me and it cut everything oh. off. So, uh, I'm not. I'm not normally that popular, but someone happened to call at that time. Um, <laughs> so, uh, oh my good, I'm, I'm, I'm probably glad it got cut off because I can just talk forever about about uh, my childhood. But um, one of the one of the one of the main um, things that happened, one of the big strategies that I found to deal with emotions was food, um, mm -hmm. and this this formed my major my major challenge uh, in life. Uh, and it was it was really about turning to food uh, as my drug of choice to deal with what was going on inside. Um, I experienced a lot of um, anger and um, uh, from my dad, and that was really the extent of of what I felt from him. I didn't feel the the love and the care and the worry that was underneath it all. Um, and uh, as I grew larger and larger and larger. Uh, I just felt more and more like a disappointment and the harder that I tried to, um, to lose weight or, and, and to lose weight was to, to gain acceptance. Um, uh, the harder it became and the more I felt like a disappointment and that little spiral just continued and continued and continued. Um, and eventually I just gave up. I gave up trying to please people. Uh, and uh, I turned instead to try and, um, uh, to be the total opposite to my father, to, to to just be everything that he told me he didn't want in a son, lazy, disorganized, blah, 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 all the rest of it. And uh, it eventually took me down a really uh, dark path uh, and the weight just continued to, to pile on and pile on and pile on until eventually at 18 years old, um, through that kind of pathway, uh, I ended up, you know, at 250 kilos, you know, um, and um, it was really in a very, very dark place. Uh, How would you describe um, your, like, social yeah. life at that point? How would you describe life kind of trying to get out of the home where that was obviously not a maybe a positive environment? So what was it like outside the home? I spent a lot of time at mm. home. I didn't go out very much. Um, I, I wasn't doing what other kids were doing. So I wasn't, I wasn't going out um, to parties and um, uh, going out to the city and, 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 and doing all those things. I felt, I felt uh, and found a lot of uh, solace in isolation. So I spent a lot of time on my own um, and I spent a lot of time at home. Um, and it, you know, until about 16 when I started to go out and, you know, get interested in girls and, and started to drink alcohol and, and go to house parties and things like that. But I never felt like I fit in. I never felt like I fit in. Um, social, social situations were a battlefield for me. Uh, and I really had to put on the armor in order to, to survive those situations. School discos were, were a nightmare. School camps were... Um, I, I never wanted to go on any of those. Um, and, you know, there are, there are moments I remember of, of splitting my pants, you know, in, in social situations at the school disco and, and having to stand in the corner um, and just a lot of shame and a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of that kind of, that, that feeling. So I spent a lot of time, a lot of time at home. Um, and when I was out, the armor or the mask that I wore was very much uh, designed to keep people close, to make people like me. Um, so I developed this deep 
um, ability to read people and to uh, to watch people. I was very observant and uh, I made sure that I said the right thing at the right time and became very good at listening <laughs> and uh, developed charisma and charm um, and performed a lot. You know, I got up on stage a lot. I sang, I danced, I made a fool of myself. I was the class clown. Um, and it was all designed to make sure that people loved me and liked me. I couldn't bear the thought that there was someone out there who didn't like me. So I made it my kind of mission to make sure that everyone liked me. Um, so meanwhile, at home, when I was by myself, I was full of rage and, and, and anger that, that I was suppressing uh, and pain and hurt and a lot of sadness. So I was two different people, two, two different faces. Um, yeah. And how, how were your parents supporting you at that point? Like, was, how was that kind of relationship at that point? I didn't understand how painful it was. I, I, I guess I still don't because I'm not a parent, but I, but I guess I didn't really acknowledge or understand how painful it would be to have a son um, or a child who was going down a path that was very clearly a self-destructive path and, and growing so overweight and struggling so much and in so much pain. Um, so they really did all that they could do, which was worry <laughs> and um, worry and, 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 and try and make life as easy as possible for me. Um, you know, dad showed his and expressed his love through money. Um, he's a, 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 an Italian man who came to Australia when he was young and you know, got his first job at 10 years old to pay for his like school shoes, right? So he's been working since he's 10, waking up at 6 a.m. delivering papers. Money has been his freedom. Um, and it, his, and it was the only way that, that, that he could give the thing that he didn't get as a child. So that was, that was the basis. So it was, I always had anything that I wanted, um, in terms of money financially, I never had to worry, never really had to work, uh, for it. Um, but, uh, I always felt that there was something deeper missing. So I had, had, had the money, but, but not the other thing, you know? Uh, which was, you know, love and acceptance and approval and all of those things that 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 I kind of needed. So, what question was I answering? Just the relationship with your parents. Oh right. So um, yeah. So 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 you can imagine the the relationship with my parents uh, started to take a really downward turn. I felt I couldn't open up to them. So I so I shared very little with them. I ended up not not talking to them. I always felt that if I, if that, if, if I revealed anything about me, I would be judged or criticized or, uh, get in trouble. So I was always afraid of getting in trouble. So I lied a lot. I lied a lot. Uh, I would call myself a compulsive liar mm. as a child growing up a you know, child, even into adulthood, uh, lying about things that I didn't even need to lie about, you know, things that it was easier to tell the truth. I would even lie parents, friends, teachers. So um, there was, I had, I had built a, an incredibly strong uh, wall that, that, um, that, 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 I, that no one could really get through. And it was just this, this blankness on the outside. I mean, while I was trying to hide on the inside. So the relationship with my parents was, was not great at that time. Very little communication. Uh, there was a period there um, where I didn't speak to my dad. I couldn't even be in the same room with him for probably three, four years, or maybe even longer. Mm. Yeah. Wow. And so then, what happens? You know, eighteen years old, you find yourself, you know, quite large. So then, you know, what happens hmm. from there? You know, obviously, there's, um, you know, obviously, you've shared, you know, potentially how that's all happened. How you. You know, that size just kind of crept on, but, you know, you're 18 and you're, you know, you're a sizable kid. So, you know, what's life like after 18? 
Um, so I, I had really made a decision at 17 years old that I was, I was really no good at anything and that the only thing that I could do or would do was just continue to eat. So, I, I, you know, there was a decision that I made a, a, around 17 um, that was caused by kind of moments of this incredible pain where I kind of just, I'm just going to eat myself to death and literally went about the process of eating myself just to see how far I could go, you know, uh, and really started working towards that reality of, of, you know, getting so big that they would have to cut the side of the house out to crane me out, you know, to go to hospital. That was kind of the, the vision I had um, and that I was working towards um, from 17. So between 17 and 18, I put on, probably upwards of 60 kilos just in that last year as I was finishing high school. Um, And uh, it just got to the point where I was coming back from schoolies at the end of 18 and just um, realizing that, holy shit, like (laughs) if I don't, if nothing happens, like, I don't know, I, I can't continue this way. Like something needs to change. Um, so the beginning of 2005 was when basically with my parents, uh, I decided to get weight loss surgery, um, which was a lap band, which is where they put a little band around the top of your stomach so that you create a little stomach on top and any food that you eat, uh, you feel full uh, and you stop eating. Um, and that's, that's what I had. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I thought it was the greatest thing ever because, um, I was just losing weight really easy, really quickly. Yeah. Um, and I thought, well, this is great. <laughs> don't have to do anything and I'm losing weight. And, um, I lost 50 kilos very, very quickly, like within the first, I would say six months. Um, but uh, I very quickly realized that nothing actually changed, you know, like it was only a physical restriction to the amount of food that I could eat. So um, the emotions, it was, it was just another, uh, the only method, the only strategy I had developed to deal with those emotions was to push them inside. Uh, and I had corked, corked it up with food and pushed it all down, but now I couldn't even do that. So, um, as you know, it just, um, the unconscious drives that drove me to binge eating were still there. Uh, and that's what I did. So, um, and Chris, Chris is here actually, Chris, I went to high school with Chris. We were in year, year 10, year 12 together. And he's just re- remembering, uh, remembering times. I remember all the laughs we had in class and you're singing at the back of the bus. So it's like, it, that was all a character that I had created unconsciously to, to, to make Chris, make people like Chris like me and, and love me. So it was all, it was all developed. Um, and by the time, so I've had surgery and I just started eating more and more food um, progressively, which started to stretch that little stomach and the, the whole surgery, I basically ate my way through it. Um, and it, it just got to a point where after I lost 50 kilos, I didn't lose any more weight after that. And then I was like four years of that. And the course of that four years from 2005 to 2009, my mental health, my emotional health, um, depression, anxiety, all spiraled way out of control. Um, and, uh, in 2009, I found myself really at the, at the, at the absolute rock bottom, uh, of my life with, um, uh, basically a bulging disc in my lower back that, that meant I couldn't really walk. So I was bedridden. I was taking a whole lot of painkillers, you know, just going from doctor to doctor to try and find, someone who would prescribe me these painkillers. And um, uh, yeah, it was kind of, at the, the, I mean, this is so much to my story. Uh, I'm kind of just r- rambling. So um, it was, to sum it up, it was, I had 
gotten surgery because I felt like it was a magic pill. Yeah. Uh, and my idea was that I would have surgery and then I would disappear from the world. And that's what I did. And then I would come back a year later and I would be exactly the weight that I wanted to be. And uh, I would emerge and it would be a great success story. And I'd be a, and I would be a superstar, a rock star, and everyone would congratulate me. And I would tell everyone that I lost weight by eating chicken and broccoli. And, uh, and because I didn't tell anyone I had weight loss surgery. So, um, because I was so ashamed of it, um, but it just didn't work out that way. Uh, and there's just so many things that happened in between that. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's so much to it. But um, if we, you know, if we had to I, meet yeah. you at that point in your life, um, mm. can you share any, I guess, standout experiences? Like, obviously, you said one of them was, um, you know, at that rock bottom point. But can you kind of share anything else that you remember from that time? Like rock bottom, what would rock bottom, me seeing you at rock bottom? Uh, like you said, there's depression. How is that getting expressed? How are you showing up to the world? How are mm. you kind of, you know, holding yourself at that point? Okay, so at that point, it was it was all that facade, that character was all starting to crumble away. I could not hold it up any longer. So the physical pain was was bursting through me. Um, I had a, a totally numb left leg from the top of my hip all the way to my toe. Um, I was crooked at a 45 degree angle. Um, my hair was just everywhere. My face was, was uh, white as a ghost with bags under my eyes. Uh, I was watching pretty much exclusively horror movies uh, alone in my room. And the only time I left the house was to go drive through KFC and McDonald's where I would eat the food in the car around the corner because I didn't want to bring it home. I wasn't speaking to my parents. So the only time they would see me was as I left my room to go to, to get in the car to get food. And I hadn't seen friends in, in probably over six months to a year. Um, uh, I had been fired from my job <laughs> because uh, I had, I had lost my temper at colleagues and clients. So that was, that was done. Um, and I was, um, and of course I was, I was having crazy amounts of painkillers every day smoking a whole bunch of, of, of weed while I was watching horror movies. So you can imagine I was just filling myself with, with poison mm. basically. And yeah. that poison came, came out, came out towards people. Um, my, my little sister at that point would burst into tears every time she saw me. Um, and she would, she would run up and give me a hug. And my family was, was, was being torn apart. So uh, I was the centerpiece of, of a tornado of, of pain and, and, and destruction and everywhere I went, I kind of left that in my wake. I was such a powerful force of negativity. I mean, I'm a powerful force of anything, but at that time it was negativity and, uh, and I influenced the energy of, of everyone around me and everything around me. So to walk down the street, um, people would cross the street and uh, I couldn't make eye contact with people. Um, so what maybe that paints a little point? bit more of a, of a picture. What's the breaking point? The breaking point was, the, the breaking point was uh, when I found my, when I had a, an appointment with a neurosurgeon and uh, I couldn't sit in the chair, so I was lying on his office floor. My mum had taken me, and we were basically there to look at this bulging disc in my back and how to fix it because I was kind of in a spot. I, I couldn't really walk, but I want to lose weight, but I couldn't lose weight because I couldn't walk, because I couldn't exercise. And it was like that experience of there are so many things going on that I don't know where to start. And I was looking again for someone who was going to fix me. And I turned to this neurosurgeon as the next great hope or the next magic pill. And uh, he basically said, as I lying on the floor, sweat dripping down my face to me that um, we, we have to, we're going to perform spinal fusion surgery on you. Uh, the, 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 and he gave me all the numbers, like the percentages of what was going to happen. It was like 50% uh, chance 
uh, it will change nothing. Regardless if it changes nothing, it will be a six-month recovery where you kind of have to learn to walk again. Um, worst case scenario is you will never walk again, like we, something will go wrong. Uh, and of course, there's chance of death and, and all the rest of it. And I was like, yep, sign me up. At that point, it was better. It was a better option than just doing what I was doing. Um, and I was ready to go. I was like, yep, sweet, fix me. That'll fix me. Then I'll be able to walk. Then I'll lose weight. Then, uh, you know. But he said, uh, I, I can't perform surgery on you because you're like 15 to 20 kilos too heavy. I've never done surgery on someone this big. So you have to lose that weight before. And I was, I got furious. I got so angry and all of that anger and cynicism and, and hatred and poison just kind of rushed out of me. And uh, I remember directing it at him, you know, like, how can you, how can you do this to me? <laughs> you're also the one that's supposed to fix me. How can I lose weight if I can't walk? You're supposed to fix me. And um, I was caught in that kind of anger. I remember looking up at my mum who was sitting there and she was bawling her eyes out. I mean, tears, pain, and I saw it all in her and it kind of just switched. Uh, and I kind of, for the first time, felt that pain uh, and realised that the decisions that I was making were the cause of that pain and it kind of all connected like bing 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 all together and i uh, saw stepped outside myself and saw the, the whole picture of, of what was happening uh, to my life as, as the centerpiece of this thing um and that stuck with me that stuck with me even even to to this moment because i saw how the family was being torn apart you know, my sister, my, my dad and their relationship and everything. And, um, yeah, I, I couldn't shake that feeling. I couldn't shake that feeling of, um, understanding of, of what I had been doing and things didn't change then. It was just, that was a, a moment of realization about, okay, what am I going to do now? This, the surgeon won't even perform surgery on me. So what's left? <laughs> um, so that's what that looks like right then at the bottom. And uh, I, I guess that was the catalyst. That was, that was the moment. So it wasn't actually when I was at my biggest. It was, it was much later on, years later, after I'd already had surgery, um, when, when that changed. And uh, the, the very next thing that I did after that, an opportunity came into my life. A good friend of mine, a beautiful man, uh, invited me along to a weight loss retreat that he had been to before and he was going back to and um, we decided to go together so again I went to my parents and said hey I want to do this they were like another thing <laughs> uh, is this going to work so I went along to that and it was four weeks that I stayed there exercising every day you know at first I at first I, I I've got video of it I literally couldn't step up and down onto a block for a minute my heart rate was through the roof. And that's where I started. Exercise, uh, eating, learning about nutrition, all the physical stuff. Um, that's where I meditated for the very first time. That's where I did Tai Chi for the very first time. Uh, and just literally started to take one step, one step, one step. Uh, that was 2010. And it's just been, it's just been um, a journey of healing since then. Yeah, one step at a time but it started very much with the physical. Yeah, that, that's what I want to emphasize. It was just all physical. It was all just grit, determination, decision, daily uh, habits, uh, willpower, all of that stuff. That's, that's what it started with. How do you get that discipline when you've n almost never had that control? You know, like you talk about your childhood, you talk about your 20s. How do you... You know, like, how do you step into that? What was it just that you just wanted it so badly? Uh, no, no, I had to die. I had to die. I had to let everything burn. I had to literally die and become someone new. Um, and uh, I, I, I remember the moment where you kind of all upgraded or switched. And it was at that retreat where 
I kind of, uh, one of the coaches said to me, you know, basically all you're doing here is eating a certain way and exercising. That's it. That's your job right now. Um, and it kind of clicked because he said to me, you know, who, who else has the job of eating and exercising? Uh, and I said, I don't know who. And he said, an athlete. And I said, wow, that's true. Like an athlete just gets paid to eat and exercise, right? And that's just what they're going for, performance. So it was a switch in my switch where I said, I'm an athlete, I'm an athlete, I'm an athlete. And I just kind of just kept, you know, drilling that in and my entire identity shifted. And I was just like, okay, this is it now. Um, so in terms of willpower and determination, I was no longer a person who was trying to lose weight because if you're a person who's trying to lose weight, you will always be a person who's trying to lose weight. You will always be a person who's not good enough as they are and are trying to do something to change yourself in order to be a different person. Uh, whereas, you know, it's the same thing with people who, who, who want to quit smoking. If you offer a cigarette to someone who doesn't smoke, they'll quite simply say, no, thank you. I'm a non-smoker. But uh, for someone who is a smoker, who is trying to quit and you offer them a cigarette, they may say to you, uh, oh, no, no, no. Uh, I'm trying to quit or I shouldn't. Um, that person is a smoker who's trying not to smoke. And it's, that's willpower, that's determination, that's like uh, gritting your teeth, that's prison sentence, you know, just get through this and one day eventually you just won't want to smoke anymore. Well, it's, it's bullshit, it doesn't work that way. Uh, the people who are successful at changing those things in their life literally shift identities, upgrade identities so that you offer them a cigarette and they say, no, I'm not a smoker, I just don't smoke. I'm not a person who smokes. And that's the same with uh, anyone who's trying to shift anything, whether it be a gambling addiction, a diet addiction, or, or, or lose weight or anything like that. Um, and that's very much what, what, what happened to me. So it no longer became a game of willpower. It was just what I did. Um, uh, yeah. And how did you work on the emotional stuff? So obviously you've got the physical that's kind of getting transition. So diet, exercise, but, you know, as you were saying before, you know, it starts with the emotional stuff, you know, you eat, eating to suppress an emotion. So how does that then unfold through this story? Hmm. Uh, I shifted my strategy from eating food to exercise. So exercise, uh, training, working out and eating right, that, that became the strategy I used to deal with emotions. Okay. So it just shifted. It shifted from eating to 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 working out. Now, uh, is that a positive thing? Well, I guess so in some senses. Meaning, to I needed. I, I guess I needed to lose weight. So the strategy needed to shift somewhere. Uh, was exercising, working out, and eating right a more positive direction than eating food, watching horror movies, and taking painkillers? Yes. But it was very much a uh, uh, um, a pushing away from pain, as pain was the stimulus. Pain was was what I was what I was running from. So you know, it's like someone lining up in the pool, getting ready for a backstroke, and pushing off the wall. And the wall is the pain. I don't want that. I'm going to push away. But of course, you don't actually know where you're going. Um, because you're not facing forward. So I was still doing whatever I needed to do to get away from the pain of being so overweight and the pain of, of, of being full of pain and anger and, and, and hatred and, and all of those things. But I, I didn't really know where I was going. I was just get me away from, from that. So uh, the pain was my fuel for a very long time and pain fueled me um, all the way to, you know, losing, getting right down to 116 kilos oh, wow. Wow. working as a personal trainer. Um, there's a, there's a photo that I have of me, you know, with muscles and sweating and working out and um, my, and, and, and really seeking my validation from 
that, right? I began to compete for Instagram likes. I began to compete. To, my goal at that point was to have the world's greatest before and after photo. That was kind of like my driving force. But it all, it all stemmed from uh, running away and pushing away from pain. So uh, that can only take you so far. Pain is a great motivator, but um, as long as you uh, rely on pain to motivate you, then you, you will always find pain in your life. You will always find suffering. Uh, and if there's none left, then you'll create it. And, um, you know, during this time, getting down to that weight, I met, I met Marat. Um, and when I say I met her, um, I say I met her again. So Marat and I had met at uni all the way back in 2006 when I was over 200 kilos and we had become friends. And uh, our friendship, you know, our friendship was, was, was built on those that mask that I had developed. Um, so we, we talked a lot and spent a lot of time together and then kind of went our separate ways and caught up throughout the years and did our own thing. Um, and uh, at this point, after all of that work, the physical work, um, we kind of re found each other again and things were just really different, right? the power dynamic had shifted. I'd lost all this weight. I was you know, feeling good and looking good and, and, and super high confidence and, and all of that stuff. And um, yeah, so, the, so things started from there. So think about it. Now I had uh, achieved everything that I had ever dreamed of. I was the overweight guy with no future, with no hope, eating myself to death. Who, who thought I would ne I will never find love. I will never have a girlfriend uh, or a family um, to now literally the girl of my dreams who, who, who I'd always kind of obsessed over, who I thought was way out of my league. I now had her. Uh, I now had the body. I now had the muscles. I was a personal trainer, so I had influence. I was inspirational. People were asking me to share my story. I was getting all this validation and acknowledgement from outside myself and I just loved it. Um, and it's kind of everything that I've ever wanted, right? But again, that idea of, of using pain as the motivator, pain as the fuel, that, that came back. So, so, I, so I found ways to, um, to create pain in my life and, and really what that led to at that point was it just wasn't enough for me. I still felt like I needed to prove something because remember all that emotional stuff I hadn't even looked at yet. It's just all physical. How long ago was this so even, that you're talking about? 2014 okay, so into 2015. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, we had started to, to date and, and of course now I had, uh, everything that I ever wanted, but uh, it wasn't enough. And I continued to seek validation um, from outside myself. Um, uh, and uh, eventually it led me to cheating on Moret um, because it was like I was still battling and fighting with all of those things. And I'd done nothing to look at the unconscious drivers of my life. And it was just like seeking for more, more. I've got to prove to the world. I've got to prove I'm good enough. I've got to prove that I can do it. I got to prove that I'm attractive. I got to prove, you know, all of these things. Um, and that led me to, to, to that moment. And uh, at that moment, I felt, um, I felt something that I, that I, that I'd never felt before. I didn't remember feeling, which was guilt. Uh, and they say that, they say that, you know, when your value systems are, are so skewed, you know, I told you that I was a liar and a compulsive liar. So I had a lot of practice lying and, and manipulating. Um, and I felt no guilt around that because it was, that was my value system. So, did you so come guilt was clean not something that I felt. Did you come clean straight away? Or did no. You, no. Mm. no. So 
um, I felt that feeling and I knew that everything changed at that moment. I knew that, that, uh, that this was now something that had, that, that, that was in my life that would, would mean that nothing would ever be the same, that I could never have a, a, a life with Moret that was based on trust and uh, honesty because now I had this thing. So um, I pushed it down. I stuffed it all down. I said, no one will ever find out. I'm going to take this to my grave. And then off I went and we moved in together and we, we just got on with life. And I thought, this will not affect me. <laughs> this, will, this will be fine because it's just another lie. It's like, it's nothing. I've created a, an entire life, a web of lies. So this is just another one. It's not going to affect me that much. And uh, it didn't at first. But my career started to go down and my personal training started to go down and my ability to, to connect with people started to go down and all those things I had built, you know, uh, all started to deteriorate and our relationship started to really kind of hit the rocks. But we were both pretending, uh, creating an image of, of perfection that we showed to the outside world. Meanwhile, under the surface, uh, everything was was falling apart. So um, it was just shaking me up on the inside. All that emotion was coming up, and I wasn't able to to deal with it. So how was that um, going to express yeah, that, that, relationship? Uh, uh, it wasn't getting expressed. <laughs> it was zero communication. It was um, you know very little connection or deep connection sex life was 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 almost non-existent um i remember we had moved in together and Marat said uh, we need to talk and she sat down and and she very nicely and very sweetly and as as as, as gently as possible basically asked if i could help up more around the house that was it if i could help more around the house to clean and and to do that stuff and I literally couldn't say words. Like I went totally mute and I felt like uh, she's sitting there waiting for me to respond and I couldn't say anything. And I just remember feeling attacked and judged and uh, that I wasn't good enough and that this whole relationship was, was, was done and screwed because I was failing. Um, and I felt like a little boy. I really remember feeling like that big and I felt like I was in trouble from dad, in trouble from mum. Huh. And I, I didn't say anything. That whole day, that whole night, didn't say anything. And I had to send her a text the next day to try and explain some of what was going on. That was when I first said, ah, there's something going on that I need to figure out. Because uh, I used to go over to mum and dad's house for dinner. And I used to sit there at the dinner table and not be able to talk. Huh. And mum would ask me a simple question and rage would, would fury would just build up inside me. And I couldn't talk because I was afraid that, that I was going to say something uh, that would hurt, hurt them, anyone. So I didn't talk. Meanwhile, this rage was building and building and building. And eventually I would snap and she'd ask me to pass the tomato sauce and I'd yell at her or snap at her or, or something. And then I get in the car after and I would be shaking with tears and just turn to Marit and say like, what's wrong with me? Why? And she said, I don't, you turn into a different person when you're around your parents. So all these things were starting to let me know that there was something more going on, that I had to look at something else. Uh, and that's what kicked me off down the path of, of doing the emotional work. Mm. Uh, the, the the emotional work. So it was it was really stemmed from um, just a whole bunch of stuff inside um, that was that was really just shaking, trying to shake loose, and I could not I could not hide it anymore. And that's a yeah. lot that's happened over you know whatever that is twenty five thirty years of you know journey of you getting to you know even this point where you have the woman of your dreams and you have you know you would have considered at some point the perfect life, right? The life that you dreamed of, the life yeah. that gave you the woman, the body, the job, the career, the world, you know, all of that's there. Yeah. yeah. And still obviously this anger and rage and this inner kind of fire happening. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, obviously that's not getting expressed. So then 
you know, that's probably, you know, I don't know what that is, a couple of years ago. So then what happens as part of, you know, the journey to where you are today? Like there's, there's clearly still something that's, you know, like that's happened in that process. Mm. How did you become the man you are today? Like what else had to shift for that anger to kind of clear itself? So this, uh, I went and did a Tony Robbins event, uh, UPW, Unleash the Power Within. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that really shook, <laughs> shook shit up inside me. Uh, and that thing that I was holding on to, the, the big thing in our relationship, um, started to bubble up. You know, it started to bubble up every now and then. And um, I had started meditating. I started reading, I started reading, you know, recovering from um, PTSD, uh, uh, complex PTSD and childhood trauma and um, started looking into some of this stuff. So things were being unlocked. I, had, I got my first coach mm -hmm. at that time who was supposed to be a business coach, <laughs> but uh, ended up being like more of a life coach slash spiritual emotional coach. I didn't know it at the time. But this thing started to bubble up and bubble up and then I would push it down and get on with things and, and, and make sense to make the rationalization of why I didn't need to tell Marit, basically. So it would push away and then it would go another couple months would go past and then I would meditate and in the meditation it would bubble up again. As I say about meditation, it's like when you're doing it right, it's like a head-on collision with your deepest fears, yeah. you know, yeah. it, just, it, just, it, it just wasn't pleasant at all. Um, and I was starting to get in touch with it. Um, to, as I continued to be consistent in meditation, I started to kind of face all those, all those things that were all coming up and um, it felt like it was coming to a, to a point. And I remember one specific, time during meditation where um this thing where we're talking about this admission or this guilt or whatever it was bubbled up and i did what i normally do i spent the time arguing with myself debating with myself to pack it away again and you know put it back in its little box and I put it back in and it would just pop straight out again. And it was just staring me in the face saying, no, no, you can't, there's no more ignoring this. You have to do something. If you're going to be the man that you, that you want to be in your life, because I had done now work on shifting my values. So now my values were in conflict with what was inside me. So I'd been doing all this work and it was just, it was not aligning anymore. The, it was like sandpaper rubbing up against me. So I would do more work. And then I, I remember arguing with myself for like 45 minutes during this meditation to put it back in, it would pop out and put it back in and pop out. And then eventually I just ran out. I ran out of argument. I ran out of excuses. I ran out of rationalizations. There was nothing left. It was just there. And it was the overwhelming vision that flashed to me in the sense that if I ever want to be the man that I know that I can be, that I've seen in my vision, to have the relationship that I've seen in my vision, the relationship with Marette, that I would need to tell her. Um, so how did that happen? And I understood all, how did that work? How did that eventuate? How did that, you know, the coming clean bit? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that I was like, a, like that. a Thursday. I was up in... Yeah, I've shared it before. I could share that. Um, I'll see how much I share. Okay. Maybe I'll share some of the feelings around it. Yeah. Um, but uh, basically, I came to that realization on a on a say a Thursday, I think it was. Uh, and my 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 vision for the relationship flashed, and I kind of knew at that point that that I would have to tell her that that was a that that was done, and that we would have to go through um, everything that we were about to go through to get to the other side. And, and, and on the other side of it was a strength and a connection and a depth um, that was unheard of. That was 
that was at, on a level that I had never experienced. But we had, but I had, but we we had to go through this together, um, and that it would be a confronting of both of our biggest fears at once. I felt like I had a, a hand grenade, and I just pulled the pin, and uh, it was like the timer was on. So I'd like dropped it at, at our feet. Um, so all of that, all of that, the mask and the ego and everything that we'd built together in that relationship, I knew was about to be blown apart. Um, so I told her as soon as, as soon as humanly possible as I got back from Brisbane. And I think it was that night, the, the Saturday night that, um, it was, a it was a, oh God, it's probably a four hour four hour five hour conversation that that went into so many different pathways before i even got to the point of telling her and this was well this was like the time in my life where i'd ne i've never experienced emotions on that level all emotions in the lead up to telling after i made the decision to tell her to telling her that saturday night those two days now, as I think back, were some of the deepest um, feelings of, of all emotions, not just, uh, you know, upset or, or anything, but love. I remember real connection with people. Um, I remember being at the airport and waiting in line to come back to Sydney and there was a baby crying as she was walking past, a little baby screaming, screaming, crying, crying, crying as she was getting closer. Um, I just felt an overwhelming sense of love and I looked down at her and we kind of locked eyes and there was I'd never experienced that level of depth of love before for this little girl and as she looked at me she just stopped crying and I had tears in my eyes and she was just staring at me her parents were stressed and frustrated and the baby was just following behind them, but now totally silent. And no one seemed to pay any attention to this, uh, except me. The parents certainly didn't look like they noticed anything had happened, but I didn't hear the girl cry a single time after that. Um, and things were happening like that pretty consistently over that three day period uh, in the lead up. So uh, to tell Moret on that night was the most excruciating frightening, terrifying, painful moment of my entire life. Uh, um, and uh, there's probably a whole other half to that story that that's probably Moret's story to tell, but uh, it was, it was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was kind of like strap in. Um, we're going to have to get through this one way or another. So let's just go. So that was the longest night of my life. Wow. that night and then since then it's just it's just been what, what can we do to, to to get through this hey oh, it's all right we've just done an interview come say hello mm -hmm. this is ma ma this is dad you get to come down a little bit so <laughs> hello we can't hear you but say hello to everyone how are you there's about four thousand people good. watching right now oh good. <laughs> I should have got all cleaned up. <laughs> You're looking great. Good to see you. You too. Nice. See you, Dad. <laughs> so you've been through a ton of stuff, literally. Can you share, like, yeah. you know, you've been through, you know, lots of challenges, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, you know, pretty much on every level. So what have you, you know, what yeah. have you come out and gone... What lessons, what what kind of was the reason that you've had to have this experience in this life? What was the goal that's come from having, you know, this first 30 or so years of your life? Hmm. So I told you about everything that, uh, that I had developed in my life to deal with the emotions and, and a lot of that was uh, the ability to connect with people. Um, um, you know, uh, to, to, to developing that kind of charisma um, and the, um, the ability to build rapport with people very quickly. Um, all of that stuff that I developed in an attempt to, 
to bring people closer to me out of a fear of losing them. Um, I denied all that for a very long time as I was going through this journey. I kind of, as I changed and shifted and lost weight, I kind of threw all that out because I said to myself, uh, I developed all this stuff with the intent to manipulate people and lie to people. So, uh, so I, I'm going to throw all that out, not realizing that that was the greatest source of, of, of my healing power. Right. Um, so all of these experiences that I've had and things that I've developed have all led me to where I am now with an incredible ability to connect with someone and to help them heal. So I've realized that everything that I've healed from in my life um, has now trans, I guess, become part of my energy um, and given me the ability to help others who are going through um, similar things. Uh, and the more that I heal, and the more that I experience uh, healing in specific areas of my life, the more perspective it gives me uh, in the ability to sit with someone and, and allow them to, to, to heal. So um, when people come to me now and, and start to list off all of the pain in their life and all the experiences, um, I have to hold back from, from smiling. <laughs> I have to hold back from saying, oh, wow, you have so much their congratulations on the challenge that you've been blessed with. You know, someone comes to me and said, yeah, I've, I've tried every diet. I'm, you know, I, I'm the heaviest I've ever been. I cannot do it. I cannot make it work. And I'm in so much pain and I'm so frustrated. I'm so angry and I don't know what to do. And, and it's like, congratulations on the blessing, on the challenge that you've been blessed with because um, I realized that it takes a lot of work to grow to 250 kilos. It doesn't happen by accident. <laughs> you know, if someone asked me now to put on 100 kilos and get back to 250 kilos, that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of work. I, I would literally now have to make a decision, a, a real decision to do that. Um, and it would be as difficult now to put that weight on as it was to lose it without a doubt. I would have to change my identity again in order to put that way. So I, I realized there must have been a purpose for me doing that. I must have known. There must have been some sort of knowing as to why I would push myself and do that to myself. And I realized I was literally just building myself an Everest, you know, like... I told you I grew up in a house where I literally was totally blessed with a beautiful family. My parents are still together. Um, I've experienced very little death in my life of, of, of people close to me um, so far. Um, and particularly as a young kid, there was, there was no big traumas. So I had to create one for myself. <laughs> and um, one of the biggest realizations that's come to me very, very recently, I'm talking the last couple of days, was I was speaking to a mentor and she said, you, you chose, you chose to stand out, you know, you chose to stand out in this life, you know, and I realized that I had been trying to hide. I've been trying to shrink and in all my efforts to shrink, I just got bigger and bigger and bigger. In all my efforts to be invisible, I just became more and more visible. And, um, I find that every time I, every time I try and shy away from accepting the reality of my power and my true, my call to greatness, every time I, I believe I'm not worthy or step down or try and shrink, you know, I spent my whole life trying to get, be shorter <laughs> and trying to minimize my, and speak softer and, and, and trying to come in under the radar. Every time I do that, um, I find myself um, suffering, you know, experiencing the, the, the suffering of it. So uh, I guess the, the, the big lesson has been uh, to accept that my, my purpose on this, on this earth, in this life, is to, is to experience the, experience the darkness um, 
and to f- find the gold and find the treasure and then emerge and come out of the darkness and share it with the world um, and, and to light the path for others who are going through, through darkness. Uh, um, so really anything that, that, that I experience now or any pain that, that I come in contact with now uh, to heal that just means that, that that adds something that I can, that I can share with, with the world. Um, you saw my dad. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 there's more to this story and, and I would say that one of the biggest uh, challenges that I faced after the relationship, the weight the emotions was healing my relationship with, with dad um, and um, I didn't realise it but I was literally I was literally tearing myself in two to, with my hatred for, for dad um, uh, and trying to be nothing like him was was tearing myself apart, uh, and to to integrate that and, and bring that together and, and heal that relationship with him, and to be able to to live with him now and and talk with him and spend time with him uh, has been the biggest blessing in my life. And so beautiful. So, how would you yeah. you know what one bit of advice would you give to somebody that's going through you know? really a tough situation. It doesn't have to even have to be, you know, a, a weight issue or an emotion, you know, you know, if they're going through something that they're stuck in or struggling, what one bit of advice would you give to anybody that tunes in, whether it's now or the replay to, you know, really help them mm-hmm. through? Uh, well, my battery is about to die. So it's probably <laughs> been the last thing that I say. Yeah, that's right. So better we make it good, off, right? <laughs> um, I would probably say that if you're experiencing pain or anguish of any sort, that it comes down to a transition. Uh, And transitions are the most painful thing that that you can experience in life. And the suffering comes from uh, fighting the transition, right? And the transition is, is death. There's, there's, it sounds dramatic, but really it is. I've died, I've died so many times in my life. Um, and it's painful every single time because it means letting go of everything that you've ever known, uh, and not knowing what's not knowing that you're going to land on the other side, but, but taking that leap anyway. And I mean, it's like standing, uh, in a burning building at the doorway with the building burning down behind you uh, and you don't want to step out because you don't know what's outside the house. You've lived there all your life and it's burning, it's burning, it's burning. It's the fight, the fire is like licking at your heels and everything's crumbling behind you. You still don't want to step out, but if you don't step out, it, you, you're going to crumble. You get, you're going to you know, die with it. You literally have to, you know, it's like that fire gets right up next to you and then you have to just jump. And, and, and step out. So if you're feeling any of that anguish, it's look at it like a transition. And the fact that you're experiencing pain just means that you're already on the path, right? Like you, you just the fact that you're experiencing a pain means that eventually you're going to get through to the other side. Otherwise you wouldn't be experiencing the pain of it. So uh, God, if you can, if you can understand that and kind of, uh, practice that eventually you start to just you know i feel like i've spent so much time underground that uh, i can kind of see kind of see in the dark now you know what i mean it's like <laughs> yeah i can go down there and, and spend time down it's almost like a little holiday to, to to go into the darkness you know what i mean uh, you know what i'm talking about and and and, and I, I hope that people know what i'm talking about when i say that but that, that darkness now is not uncommon to me anymore because of the awareness that I've brought to it. So uh, I know that there's always, there's always some gold to be found. And, and as soon as I find it, I'll come up and share it with you all anyway. And, and uh, that's what you all have, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I don't know. Yeah. No, that's know. beautiful. And so what's your vision for the world now? What's your kind of, you know, who's, who's Nathan that presents himself to the world now and what, you know, what, 
What do you want to see in the future for yourself? Uh, um, uh, I see myself impacting a lot of people uh, on some level. I don't know what exactly that looks like, but um, I love working with people who, who are experiencing troubles with their weight, with dieting, with uh, I, I work with a lot of men to heal their relationship with their father now. I, you know that's beautiful, uh, and I seem to be attracting some really big, tough, strong men who no one's ever they, they've never really trusted anyone um, before, and I kind of enjoy cracking cracking that, <laughs> cracking through that. At the same time, working with couples and in relationships, and it's really just anyone who comes to me now. Uh, I, I love to work with. So um, that's that, that's just me. Uh, I guess right now is business. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, stepping into the, the business world and learning about money and breaking through some of that old, old stuff around money and um, experiencing more abundance and making some more money. God, that would, the, the, I'm looking forward to that. That's going to feel, that's going to feel good. Um, uh, finally. So, uh, yeah, just growing and expanding and, and creating more abundance and, and impacting more people uh, and just showing up as, as me. Um, really, uh, at the end of the day, all I do is, is, is help people feel good, <laughs> help people be happy. I'm really quite, quite, quite good at that. And that's, that, that's really it. If I, can just, if I can just remember that and do that, I'm happy. Yeah. And good on you because more of the world can do with people that help people feel good, right? So I want to thank you so much for coming on and really being really honest and real and sharing your story from your heart and, you know, really helping us understand what life was like for you and really just that whole kind of journey, which, you know, I'm sure there's much more that you could share. I'm sure there's more details and all that sort of stuff that you could have gone into, but um, what you did share was fantastic. And so if anybody wants to, I don't know, quickly ask um, Nathan anything or want to comment and just, I don't know, just tell us how you felt um, or what value you got from, you know, just hearing what Nathan had to say today, then please share. If not now, then, you know, later on, and we can certainly address that um, in the comments below. But I know people have stayed all the way through and heard the whole story. So Thanks for everyone. Yeah, who has amazing. In. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you to the internet you, so. and technology. <laughs> yes, it worked. <laughs> yeah. If we got through, so, yes. that's uh, that's beautiful. We did, we did, and yeah. uh, your phone hasn't cut off yet. So, thanks so much for it's joining us. To go. Um, <laughs> we will look forward to what you have to offer the world in the days to come. And Nikki's saying thank you so much for being so raw. And real, and I know she's already thanks, Nikki, commented a few times, so that's amazing. Yeah, thanks, Chris and, and Nikki, and all you guys who are watching. I appreciate it, and thank you so much, Ma, for having me. Uh, love you, uh, sending so much love to you, and, and can't wait to catch up with you in person very soon. Sounds wonderful, awesome. <laughs> You're an inspiration. Okay. Keep it up. <laughs> oh, Kasha, hey, I love you. Bye. <laughs> love to you. Thanks, Nathan. Bye. See you, everyone.